Hello, thanks for being in a new video. This time I have the iPhone 15 Pro. Let's give it a full review. Let's get started. This is one of the highest devices in the Apple catalog today. You have to remember that above it will be the iPhone 15 Pro Max, which in this generation does have differences besides the screen size and battery. So if you have not seen the video review of that model, I invite you to go see it after you finish watching this one. They share many features in common, but there are some differences. This device has 128 gigabytes of storage in the base model at a price of 23,999 pesos in Mexico. On the screen you see the reference price in dollars to give you an idea, but remember that the prices here are not the same as there. There is also a 256 and 512 gigabyte edition and up to 1 terabyte of storage available. Obviously all these versions will be much more expensive. Now let's describe this device point by point to see if it has enough to fight against its competitors. So let's talk about the design. This is one of the most compact devices today and the good thing is that it retains a considerably advanced photographic system and also has a lot of power, since in general compact devices usually cut a lot of corners in these two aspects that I mentioned to you. On the front it has a very good use of the screen as the bezels are really very thin, both the bottom and the sides and even the top, although there is also placed a cutout in screen that Apple has taken advantage of to have a dynamic island as part of the software. However, it is very clear that the front is very well used by this screen, which also comes protected with ceramic shield then offers a good level of protection against falls so that it is more likely to survive. On the sides it integrates the new titanium material, which as you can notice gets stained easily so you have to clean it constantly. On the right side we have the power button which is also a function button to talk to Siri. On the top side there is absolutely nothing. While on the left side we have the new action button, the volume buttons and the tray to place the nano sim card in some markets because we must remember that in the United States it comes without this tray depending only on eSIMs. On the bottom we have the new USB-C port which in this Pro model is indeed high speed plus the speaker and microphone disguised as a speaker. The back cover comes with a new textured matte glass which actually feels great to the touch and also gives an excellent aesthetic especially in this edition that is in black. Undoubtedly it looks extremely elegant, I love this design, although it is also available in white, blue and natural titanium. The camera module faithful to Apple's style remains with the same design line, keeping the essence of iPhone. Also in this back cover offers ceramic shield, and it should be emphasized that it has IP68 certification, but it is not like the IP68 certification of other cell phones, since in this case the test has been 6 meters deep for 30 minutes, so it has very high chances of surviving if it falls into the water. There is no doubt that it is a very good design, not only in aesthetics but also in resistance. It also has a thickness of 8.25 millimeters and a weight of 187 grams, so there is no doubt that we are facing a device that has not only a good design in terms of aesthetics, but also in terms of resistance. The screen will undoubtedly be spectacular despite the fact that we are dealing with a considerably compact screen. Its size is 6.1 inches and as you realize it offers excellent technology with very good viewing angles so that no matter if you are viewing the content from the front or from the side, you will still have an excellent visualization. Specifically we are talking about OLED technology with a resolution of 2556 by 1179 pixels. This screen has a very high dynamic range, which Apple calls XDR, giving some areas with a much more intense brightness when viewing content compatible with this technology. You can notice this in your own photographs or in other applications. Notice how the sky has an extremely intense illumination, while the rest of the elements have a traditional illumination to give much more realism to the content that we are visualizing, so the display really is excellent. It also offers 120 Hz in its refresh rate, which Apple calls promotion, so that it is able to show you these kinds of extremely fluid movements to make the most of the good animations that this operating system has. The truth is that there is no point that we can complain about this screen since it also has the true tone function to try to adjust the white balance of the screen with the white of the environment and thus have a much more comfortable viewing. It also has the night shift mode for comfortable viewing at night, so it's a screen that by all accounts is very good. 
Now you are about to listen to a recording with the microphones of this device. Esta es una prueba de audio con los micrófonos del iPhone 15 Pro, un modelo compacto que tiene tres micrófonos para ser exactos. It's funny the microphone layout that one is on the bottom, one is in the earpiece area for calls, so you can have a front pickup when you're recording, and we have another microphone inside the camera module. So it does pick up sort of stereo sound, although it's not completely symmetrical, but it can capture excellent quality surround sound. The speakers have a very similar layout, in that we have one speaker on the bottom and another speaker in the earpiece area for calls. So. We do not have a 100% symmetrical sound, but it does have a very good amplitude. In addition to a very good power, it is a clear, wide sound and the bass frequencies are strong enough to perceive them. But what do you think if we listen to a small test? Although, remember that it is not the same to listen to it live. The sound experience as hardware is excellent, but as software still has much room for improvement, as it does not offer access to an equalizer or something more specific, at least not in general, but only within Apple Music, and that will not be very useful for those who do not use this service. Consider also that it doesn't come with a headphone jack, so you'll have to use a USB-C adapter to be able to connect headphones via cable. Although most likely you are going to use wireless headphones, and in that sense it will be best to use AirPods because those are the only headphones compatible with the ALAC codec that Apple has released to have lossless audio, otherwise you'll be using the SBC ERC codec, so either way wired or wireless you can have good quality audio for your headphones as well. The front camera is 12 megapixels, Apple calls it true depth, and of course it also has all the technologies that Apple applies through software to improve your photos as Deep Fusion and Photonic Engine. It has its f1.9 aperture, so it has excellent light entry and it even has autofocus, so in hardware we are in front of an excellent camera. Although like many other things on the iPhone, despite having excellent hardware, the software may still feel a little short. As good things, we have excellent capture speed. Plus, if we hold down the shutter, we start a recording of and for a burst we can slide it to one of the sides, however it doesn't support easy capture via the palm gesture, so if you're struggling to reach the shutter it can be a bit more difficult photography. Fortunately you can press the volume button to take a picture but it can also cause some vibration. In this generation an automatic depth capture detector is included, it will suggest you to turn on portrait photography when it detects a face, but even if you did not turn on this portrait mode, note that it is able to capture the depth effect so that when editing your photo, you can add this blur effect in the background. This is a considerably good point. At the moment it does not have a quick shortcut through the power or volume buttons to enter the camera, you must press and hold the button that appears on the lock screen if you want quick access or map the new action button to immediately open the camera, but remember that this action button can only do one action as it does not support multiple touches, then by pressing and holding this button we can quickly enter the camera. The quality of the selfie will undoubtedly be too good, I love the color calibration that Apple has because it is an extremely accurate color and has an exaggeratedly good level of detail thanks to all the algorithms with which Apple improves photography, then I think a very positive result also offers a considerably good amplitude although it is not an ultra wide camera, and if there are other devices on the market that have a super wide front camera, however in this case if you have autofocus so no matter if you are near or far from the camera, you will come out well focused with good detail. This photograph is indoors, but in much lower conditions than I usually take pictures in this same environment, so in this case if you get to notice some areas where there is much more noise present and grainy giving a result that is not so showy, but I insist that it was a photograph with a lot of darkness, especially in this indoor area. 
In backlight I forgot to take the capture of the preview but it does not look as optimized as the final result, undoubtedly it manages to balance well lights and shadows but still appears a little noise and also a little chromatic aberration in this type of captures that are much more complicated, however I think for a front camera gives a very good quality compared to other devices. At night it could suffer a little more than I would like because if you see a slightly grainy effect then it is a camera whose optimal performance is when there is a lot of lighting, however the color is very accurate compared to other devices. In areas where there is indirect light the device will automatically enable the night mode and notice that the result is extremely good although it still has a lot of noise and graininess present, the level of detail I love, the color I also love, but I would definitely like to have a little cleaner picture. This photograph is the most complicated one because it is backlit at night with practically no lighting towards my face, so the result is good. In fact the iPhone tries to light very dimly the face so it doesn't come out spoiled either and the result is barely good due to so much noise present. And it is very curious that despite having a 3D face detection system, the camera is not able to keep objects in focus in these portrait photos with the front camera. And at night the result is going to be good with respect to blur but again there is too much presence of noise and graininess that in this price range I think we definitely can't accept. On the back we have a 48 megapixel main camera with f1.78 aperture autofocus and stabilization inside the sensor. Remember that Apple is currently the only manufacturer to use this type of stabilization which by the way is very good. We also have a 12 megapixel ultra wide camera with f2.2 aperture and autofocus so that it also works for macro shots. And finally we have a 12 megapixel telephoto camera with f2.8 aperture autofocus in sensor stabilization and also 3 equis optical zoom. So unlike the Pro Max model here we still don't have the highest zoom that Apple currently has. Interestingly Apple is also touting a sort of virtual fourth camera which is just a cut out of the main sensor. So the specs are pretty much the same as the main camera but with a 12 megapixel resolution. The experience will undoubtedly be very good, remember that it's going to allow us to take captures in a very fast way. As always I tried to capture the number 3 and in this case I succeeded. We can also take a burst of many pictures and the result is completely good for you to choose the exact moment. At the top we have a button that shows elements at the bottom. This for me is a bit inconsistent but anyway, on these elements we are going to be able to have access to some special color filters. They are not very aggressive, they just slightly change the color rendition of the camera. In fact this same thing you can use on the front camera as well. And it also has automatic portrait detection so that even if you don't tell it to, it captures the depth information so that after taking the picture you can apply this effect. If we touch the screen we can adjust the focus and the light input. But we must remember that Apple currently does not have any manual or professional mode. For that you will have to buy some other application from the App Store. For me that will be one of its weak points. The camera does not integrate a scanner within its own interface but when creating a note you can insert this document and here it does integrate a scanner that automatically detects the edges of the sheet and everything comes out perfect. Something similar can also be done from the file application. And with respect to scanning QR codes it does it from the main camera interface without any problem. Capturing moving pictures without a doubt is a very easy task for this device and in fact it comes out spectacular. I love this picture and already now you realize that outdoors it has an excellent color. And it should also be noted that the 48 megapixel photographs have a very good level of detail and are also captured in RAW so that you have a much more advanced post development in case you are very knowledgeable about photography. We have a lot of information to work with. The level of detail achieved with this mode is really 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 high. The color captured by this camera seems to me to be extremely accurate. It is a very good quality camera whose lens is also of good quality avoiding a lot of chromatic aberration, edge distortions and similar things, although we could not ask for less being such an expensive device. In interiors I was struck by the fact that it had an extremely natural and faithful representation of what was happening in the environment. Since this photograph was in a very dark environment and this device represented it in a very faithful way, saturating only the necessary colors. I found it to be a very natural photo, although it also has a bit of noise and graininess that I would have liked to see removed. In backlit captures the preview looks spectacular. 
Believe me, we did the test with other devices and they showed practically white all over the backlit area. So it's amazing how Apple has excellently worked this preview. The result after processing the photo is even better having a perfect illumination in the shadows. It looks an extremely natural result, it preserves the textures very well and the illuminated area does not look overexposed at any time, so I definitely love the result. At night it also has a very good quality result with very accurate colors. It will automatically enable a long exposure if you are in low light conditions so you don't need as a user to enable a manual mode or anything like that. Fortunately you can turn it off but unfortunately you can't force it either. So let's say it's a good experience in some things and bad in other things. This is the result with the ultra wide camera so you can see that also this lens manages to capture very good lighting although several steps below the main camera especially at the edges. But I like even more taking the picture at night with the telephoto camera because it automatically forces a longer exposure, intensifying the saturation of the colors and giving an extremely nice result. That's why I would love it if we as users were allowed to access a night mode manually even if the iPhone deems it is not necessary. Look at the level of detail that is achieved and for night photography it really surprises a lot. Now let's go back to the day to analyze how is the zoom. This is the reference photograph and here we have to start with two X's which remember that Apple promotes it as optical quality as if it were a specific lens although it's actually a kind of digital zoom by cropping the sensor and yet I think it has a good quality I think it does correspond to the 12 megapixels. So we have a good quality in this zoom, then we go up to 3x which is already optical zoom giving us again a good quality with this same level of detail of a 12 megapixel photograph. This would be the result with a 10x zoom so you can see that it manages to maintain I think a very good level of detail, good colors and finally the maximum that allows this device is 15x falling quite short compared to other devices of similar prices. That was the result with a sign but now let's see the result in faces because undoubtedly it could change the interpretation quite a bit and notice how you immediately notice that we are talking about digital zoom that does not offer a quality beyond. So 3x, yes it will give us a good quality but in the other angles you feel that it is a photograph that is not so high in level of detail. But if instead of zooming in you want to zoom out, we have the ultra wide camera available. Although we notice that despite having a lot of width in general, we will notice some areas of distortion in the edges, especially. So it is not an ultra wide camera that I found so spectacular. Possibly this is a point of improvement in the next generation as I insist that it has good color and good amplitude, but not so much quality as a lens. It also allows you to take a panoramic picture with this ultra wide camera, giving a pretty good result with lots of space, good fusion between pictures, but I insist that because this lens is not of such high quality, the picture will not look so defined. I think that for panoramic photos the result would be better with the main camera. This ultra wide camera is amazing that it lets you zoom into this distance and you're not going to believe what you're photographing because the level of detail is really good, it keeps good color and everything else. So you can perfectly capture detailed textures without any kind of problem. This was the object we were capturing but specifically in this area. So it really comes as a huge surprise but what's also surprisingly bad is that the main camera can't focus that close. So at this distance is the closest you can get with the main lens. There are other devices that let you get much closer with the main camera but this one has serious limitations. This is the result of trying to zoom in but obviously it is best to zoom in if you want to capture the texture well. And with the 8 megapixel stream mode you could also try to get more detail. However due to the nature of the lens capturing small objects can be a bit tricky with very uneven focus. That's why the iPhone automatically switches to the ultra wide lens when you are going to take these types of pictures. However the ultra wide lens does not generate as much depth of field unless you are extremely close. So I like the macro photography for ultra small objects and detailed textures but for not so small objects I find it's not such a pleasing result. The portrait photography offered by this device is extremely spectacular.
For starters, we have the result with the lens 1x, very natural, with a very subtle blur only for the most distant areas and anyway a good detection is noted even in these areas quite complex. It also allows us a photograph with 2x zoom, blurring a little stronger the background and we still have an excellent detection and very good level of detail, color accuracy and everything else. Finally, the maximum it allows in portraits is 3x, further intensifying the background blur to give an extremely natural effect and keeping the foreground areas in focus. There is no doubt that I really like the result of portraits with this camera. At night it will also give us good quality portraits, although again, as I showed in the Pro Max model, there are some reflections of the lights that are not very pleasant. This would be the result with the 3x lens. At night it seems that it may suffer a little more to define well because there is not so much illumination but I still find it a positive result, although with much more noise than I would like. Video recording is one of the things the iPhone does best and as you might notice it can go up to 4K at 60 frames per second, it even defaults to the HDR video recording setting and you can even lock the white balance, you also have Apple ProRes as a higher quality video recording format and you can even select log encoding if you want to colorize the video later, these are quite advanced video recording options. When recording a video we are going to have a very convenient ring to zoom in and out. In addition you still have access to the presets of this same zoom. You can also take a screenshot of the video you are recording but you cannot pause the content nor can you turn on the flashlight while recording. So those kinds of little details make the experience for me still not 100% satisfactory. In fact, you also can't rotate to the front facing camera while you're recording your video. So there are several things that Apple could improve. If you tap on the screen, you can adjust the focus and also the lighting, but again it doesn't have a professional recording mode with manual adjustments. Video recorded with iPhone is always a very attractive point because of how natural the colors come out. In this case we also have a good white balance, exposure that is not jumping, and I even showed you that you can lock the white balance in case you see it necessary. So the video comes out very well. Although the video is recorded by default in HDR, so it might complicate some users to handle these videos in other applications or outside the iPhone. But inside the iPhone it will display excellent. Here you're looking at the indoor shot which also came out very natural. Maybe it doesn't look spectacular in terms of having a lot of light or saturated colors, but this is really how it looked in real life. In backlighting it definitely performs too well. When it detects a face it does try to light it but it doesn't quite sacrifice the background. So it never feels like the background is overexposed, you see an extremely natural result with very accurate colors and no aggressive changes in exposure. And in the evenings we will again have a very good result, good definition. In this case there is not so much noise, we also have a good color balance, good level of detail. In general it is a device that, as I said, is going to record with a very good quality. If you switch to the ultra wide lens, you're going to notice that it's not as good as the main camera. That's why I insisted that it's likely that the next generation will improve this element. I don't think it's a bad recording either, but you do notice that it does increase noise a bit more and the level of detail is reduced when you're with the ultra wide camera. And the behavior with the telephoto camera is a little bit curious because there are times where you're definitely not going to switch to that lens because there's not as favorable lighting conditions. So we don't have as much detail zooming in recording video at night. The default stabilization of the device is good and here it boasts good stabilization inside the sensor. When you are walking you will not perceive a very aggressive movement and when you are running also manages to balance the movement in a very good way. Although if you want the most spectacular shot possible, you should use the action mode where the stabilization definitely reaches an extreme level. Although it is no longer able to record all this on video, but anyway it even seems that you are carrying a special stabilizer because the result is definitely extremely good. Regarding the zoom, you know that iPhone combines perfectly well all its cameras so they work as if they were one, all can record in the same resolution although it does feel a little change between one camera and another but maintains a good quality. 
In addition, the fact of having good stabilization also benefits a lot to the result we have when recording with zoom, however the range is very short, reaching only up to 6x, so here it does feel a very short experience, but the good thing is that you can zoom in and out smoothly. The focus as I mentioned in the picture could be complicated if the object is very close, so it must be at a considerable distance for the device to be able to focus due to lens limitations. It seems to me that in this model I do not see a focus as accurate as we saw in past models, so here I see neither so much precision nor so much speed, although this could be corrected with an update. This device does give us a cinema mode with a very nice blur for the background. The truth is that I love the result, it is easily the best device to record with this type of special effects, as it even changes the intensity of the blur depending on the distance I have with the camera, giving a very natural result. It is also able to detect not only the person, but objects that are at the same distance to have an extremely natural result, so no other device manages to record with this same quality in portrait video mode. In fact it lets you use the virtual 2x while keeping the video in 4k, so we also have a nice result, although with this lens the edges feel a little more artificial. The slow motion of this device reaches up to 240 frames in full HD, so it is good but not spectacular, we will definitely find other devices with slower camera. It also offers us a fast camera which comes with stabilization, although curiously only in full HD and with an automatic speed adjustment, then the fast camera I think is very bad compared to so many options that other manufacturers offer us. The front camera also records in excellent quality, maintaining the 4K resolution, also maintaining a good stabilization, although here we do not find stabilization inside the sensor, but what I like most is the accuracy that has the color, in addition to the excellent dynamic range. This scene was extremely complex due to the clouds so illuminated that there were, but believe me there are other devices that even in these conditions came to burn the ground, then in this case the recording quality seems to me supreme, also remember that it has autofocus so if you want to use it to show some content to your audience you can perfectly do it. Indoors with very low light conditions, you will notice that it may suffer a little more if it has some mechanism to try to reduce noise, but it does not seem to me the most spectacular, but remember that specifically this environment was much darker than it normally is. And notice how we have the result at night with a little less accurate color than in the daytime, but compared to other devices I think it does have good accuracy, obviously it will not be free of noise present there, in fact if there is a lot of movement the noise will appear a little more. In the more static shots the noise will try to be reduced considerably, but I think I did not love this result, so the convenient thing to do with the front camera will be to record in good lighting environments. This front camera also allows us to record using the cinema video mode, blurring the background, so the result is extremely good because it keeps good color rendition, in fact it is curious that it keeps objects in focus, while in photographs it was not able to do that. And something that I had forgotten to mention to you that also works with the rear camera, is that it is also able to focus on people behind you by blurring the foreground, and that is something that no other device offers, because you can also adjust the focus by touching the screen. Here in the front camera you can have a slow camera that is basic, because it goes in full HD at 120 frames per second, and you also have a fast camera, although it has the same drawbacks as in the rear camera, and remember that it also does not include a dual recording mode natively, although you could install applications to perform this task. This device debuts version 17 iOS, which is an extremely mature operating system, although it still focuses on a fairly simple and minimalist experience, so if you are someone who likes to modify many areas of the system or have too many tools, this option might be a bit limited. The good news is that Apple offers an extremely extended support, practically 7 years of updates, so this device will have a long lifespan. Also as always it is worth noting some of the special features that Apple integrates in this device such as the dynamic island in which we can have some tools to quickly go back and take a look at applications. There could also appear the music player to quickly go back to it and other tools. So Apple has managed to transform something that physically does not sound so attractive through its good software. Another new thing is the action button that I had already told you about a moment ago but you can only map the long press. It doesn't have other options for single press, double press or triple press, 
which would give you a lot more versatility. So although it's a good thing that Apple lets you select the action you want, it seems to me that it could be much better. Remember that it also allows you to select some shortcut of your preference that you have created and this is another outstanding feature as the shortcuts app gives you a lot of versatility to be able to automate various things on your iPhone, not only by pressing the button but also based on many other conditions. There is also the novelty called contact poster from which you can customize your call screen both personal and those of other contacts so that in case you want you can exchange different covers and select the perfect fit. It automatically suggests you some pictures with portrait mode. You can also pinch to crop this photo. You can also switch between different color styles, which as you can see are adapting and also detecting the depth of this picture. You could even select some other color. So it's great to be creative and create your own cover art. This way you can customize how the screen will look when a specific contact calls you. And remember that they have also added a feature called name drop, so that by simply bringing the devices together, you can share your contact card. Curiously, in this case, it did not show the animation that almost always shows. But anyway, the contacts are shared with the covers that you had already created. And if you have the device in landscape and you put it to load, you can enable the new feature called standby. Through this function, you will be able to use your iPhone as if it were a small table clock, where you can have different styles too, with different information. The truth is that it can be useful to charge your phone at night or something similar. In fact, it could also serve you as a photo frame since it also has several effects available here. It is also worth noting the functions to easily extract stickers from your photos. You simply press and hold and tap add sticker. This library of stickers will be available in any other application and that is something very positive since they will always be inserted in PNG format unlike the Android ecosystem. In the gallery, we will also be able to extract text easily, both from photos and videos. Apple has also announced several new features in iMessage, especially in group conversations, but honestly, I do not have any group in iMessage. Remember that from this application, you could also send messages using your own Animoji. Apple has also decided to incorporate new widgets available, so we have a very good variety, and now you can interact with those widgets by having buttons, because it was not available before. There's also a lot of customization for the lock screen, allowing you to change not only the background but also the style of the clock and of course it's going to take advantage of the depth information that some pictures have. You can also add some quick information widgets in a very easy and convenient way. And also remember that this lock screen can stay with the screen always on, as it is an extremely efficient screen that is not going to consume so much power. So the truth is that even the animation makes this effect look extremely attractive. And while we're on the lock screen, let's talk about security, as it integrates Face ID, i.e. Uh, facial recognition. However, it does not have a fingerprint reader, which is an absence that could weigh on many people. Recognition through Face ID will be good because yes, it is in three dimensions, so it offers a good level of security. It also allows you to add an additional look in case you wear a beard at times or something similar. And you can also add Face ID with face cover so you can unlock it even with this accessory on. You can tell it if you require your eyes to be directed to the phone for it to unlock. And you can also determine which things can be accessed even if the device is locked. Apple will leverage Face ID for other areas of the system, for example to access your password keyring. So just like that, through your face it can remind you of passwords and automatically fill them in for you. In security management, Apple also offers something very good in the screen time section, where you can add limits, restrictions and other settings for privacy. In case you are going to lend this device to a little one, you can add various limits here. So it can be quite useful in this case. It comes with a very good family setting, but I would also love it to have a kids mode so that in case you are going to lend the phone for a few minutes to a little one, you can just enter that mode and that's it. But that option is not available here. And as always, Apple has highlighted the issue of privacy and remember that this device allows you to select that applications do not track you so they do not learn your tastes and are not offering you advertising of the same. So it is a tool that in the Android ecosystem we are definitely not going to find. The battery is 3650 milliamps, which if you just look at it as a number definitely sounds like a battery that's too short. 
but at least in my testing it lasted pretty well. I was running a benchmark and watching YouTube videos, alternating them for 15 minutes and managed to drain it 50% in about the same amount of time as it did with 5 milliamp battery devices in my Android test. However, they are not totally equivalent tests, but I could tell you that it does have good battery life probably because of the new processor that comes in a 3 nanometer process. So honestly, the battery hasn't really made me suffer. You can also enable a saving mode for day-to-day -day use, although it doesn't yet have an extreme saving mode for emergency occasions. Regarding charging, it supports up to 20 watts. The charger is not included in the box, but fortunately it supports power delivery. So if you have other chargers with this technology, you could also charge this device. In 15 minutes, I recovered 28% of the power on this device. In 30 minutes, 57% and the full charge finished in 1 hour and 31 minutes as the last 5% makes it too slow. This is to try to take care of the battery. And by the way, here in the settings you can appreciate the maximum capacity that it has and you can also select if you want to block the charge up to 80% to take care of the battery even more, especially if you are one of those users who need to have their cell phone connected all the time to the current. You could also have the charge optimized in case you are one of those users who leave their cell phone charging all night, although it is not an activity that I recommend anyway. So the battery currently has good care options and good battery life. The only thing I would miss would be the more extreme saving mode. The connectivity of this device is considerably good, as it supports Wi-Fi 6E networks, so you will have very good download speeds. It even supports 5G networks on mobile data as well. So, here you will also find good speed and best of all, it does have a selector for you to decide which applications you want to be allowed to use your mobile data and which applications you do not. It also has Bluetooth 5.3 technology for good stability in the connection with your accessories and also has NFC to make mobile payments using Apple Pay. Although this NFC chip does not work the way Android devices work for other things, so consider that you will only be able to use it for making payments. Through its USB-C port, you can connect other accessories to it because it does have OTG technology. You could even record directly to an external storage drive so you can record videos with extremely high quality. You will also be able to project your screen using AirPlay technology, so it can be to Apple TV or TVs that also integrate this technology, but it is still not that common to find many compatible screens. If you want, you can also project via cable with an HDMI adapter, and of course it has Apple CarPlay so you can connect it to your car's display. The sensors will work fine and it's just worth noting that it doesn't have a proximity sensor because it uses the entire true depth camera system, but all the other sensors work without a hitch. Apple's ecosystem is undoubtedly the best there is today. However, we must also consider that it is a closed ecosystem, so it has certain limitations to coexist with devices from other brands. So if you are interested in buying an iPhone, but you also want to have a tablet, a watch or something like that, you should be aware that it is highly likely that you will need to buy all Apple products if you want a perfect coexistence. The Apple Watch is seamlessly integrated with the iPhone to interact excellently with each other. It even serves to see what you are capturing through the camera and many very advanced tools. You also have AirDrop to send files wirelessly between devices of this brand and virtually all its accessories are easily discovered on the main screen. Remember that for the Internet of Things, Apple has its HomeKit compatible with Matter, then we also have several accessories compatible with all this and you can control everything from your cell phone. And regarding cloud storage, Apple offers 5 GB of iCloud for free and after that you will have to pay if you want to have more storage, but everything is also integrated. So Apple is a brand that has a lot of strength for the ecosystem and offering a lot of services because it also offers Apple Music, Apple TV+, Apple Fitness+, and even Apple Arcade. So we have a lot of things that can interact with each other with the whole ecosystem. So that's why I say it's the most complete ecosystem, but at the same time it's the most closed ecosystem. This device has the Apple A17 Pro processor, an extremely powerful processor that is the latest Apple has so far, built on a 3 nanometer process so it is very energy efficient as well. It took on average 2.1 seconds to open each of these applications giving us an extremely good experience. It has 8GB of RAM so remember that it has excellent inter-app sharing as well. 
However, due to the very nature of this operating system, you probably can't run things in the background. So when you are editing a video, or even if you are uploading some content, you should not leave the application to continue running. Unlike Android, where we have a different multitasking system. However, notice that if you're working quickly between multiple applications, well, everything pretty much stays running extremely smoothly. So in that sense, it's very good. As I mentioned before, the storage starts at 128 gigabytes, but the one terabyte version is also available, which is the one I have here with me. And notice how we have way too much storage available. Barely a fragment is what is occupied and that we already have several heavy games installed, several photos and several videos. The behavior it will have inside the applications is going to be very good too, allowing you a quite comfortable scrolling without any problems. And remember that generally applications always arrive better optimized for iPhone. I think there's no argument about that. So really the experience using this device is just too good in terms of performance. Let's test now how fast it is able to export these videos in 4K recorded with this device with HDR since this is the format in which the iPhone gives preference to record. That's it, it took about 39 seconds which is good considering it's an HDR video. So it is a device that does allow you a good video editing. But now let's try to export it without HDR just to see if there are any differences. It took about the same amount of time, so there's no difference, at least in this video editor. You know that may vary, but we could not consider it the most powerful device for video editing on mobile. In Call of Duty by default, it loads very high quality at a high rate. However, we also have maximum quality available at maximum rate. Ultra rate is also available, but it will lower the graphic quality, so it is up to you as a user what you will prioritize. Choosing the maximum quality, we do have available all the effects that this game has and even though unfortunately we could not have a specific monitoring, since this iOS version is not yet compatible with the software we use to perform the frames per second measurement, we can conclude that we had an excellent experience. Obviously it is not going to be an experience without any hitches because at the time of recording the screen above all some punctual moment could occur but it is nothing really serious. To the naked eye, we could consider that the lowest it got was about 50 frames per second because it really maintains an extremely fluid performance. And it should be noted that despite having all this fluidity, it also has excellent graphics quality, unlike other devices that sacrifice too much graphics quality in order to give more fluidity. Although this device also gets to sacrifice graphics quality, but in exchange for giving you 120 frames per second, which by the way you do notice on the screen, as well as maintaining a good temperature. So sincerely that here I have not had any detail or inconvenience with heating, even in this type of content that requires high processing on your chip. So we have excellent quality. There is no moment where we can say that there is a bad experience even though there came a moment where it slightly lowered the brightness of your screen due to heating prevention, but not as much as it was lowered on the iPhone 14 Pro Max. So we had a very good gaming experience. In the Legends game we have as always the automatic quality, but in this case we turned it up to ultra at 60 frames per second to see how this device was doing in this test. And the truth is that it behaved quite well. When recording the screen it did get a little bit warmer, reaching about 42.2 degrees Celsius, but without recording the screen stayed much cooler. Again, here it is noted that the game goes up to 120 frames per second with very good reflections and good graphics quality. It should be remembered that this processor already supports ray tracing, although that will have to be seen which developers implement it in their games. For now there does not seem to be so much content already optimized, but it certainly promises a lot so that in the future several games will be updated and take advantage of all the capabilities that this processor has. In the Spongebob game, the default setting is high resolution and high quality. However, for the test we set it to epic with 60 frames per second. The experience we could say was perfect. This content does not go up to more than 60 frames per second and probably that's why the experience was perfect because this processor runs these graphics too well. So to complicate your life you would have to bump it up to 120 frames per second but this game does not have that setting available. The quality is too good, there was no serious overheating, just traditional overheating. So it's very good. In Henshin Impact by default, the graphics are in high quality. 
But for the test we selected the very high quality and we also selected 120 frames per second which is the setting that is available on this device because in the Android world this setting does not exist. Also the blur we set it to very high. So as you'll notice this is the most complicated test we've ever put on a mobile device because here it does show compatibility with this setting. At the beginning it did run at 120 frames per second but after a little while you notice that the performance dropped to 60 frames per second probably so that it wouldn't overheat because the temperature stayed considerably well. So I think this chip still fails to maintain a super smooth performance in this type of ultra heavy content for prolonged sessions as it would need a little more cooling but if you don't demand that much from it in terms of graphics quality it's going to maintain a very good experience. Even you yourself are seeing that here when recording the screen was fine but there was a moment where it dropped considerably to about 10 frames per second approximately although I insist that we could not have an accurate measurement due to the incompatibility of the operating system with the software we use to measure. So even though it gives a very good experience if you are a dedicated gamer you probably want to consider devices that bring fan or many more layers of cooling. And with that we have come to the end of this video. I hope you liked it. If you did, you know you can let us know and we'll see you next time.